the world looks upon me as I struggle along. You say I am nothing, but they are so wrong. In my heart, they rejoice in how I wish they could see. There's a roof up above me I will be playing just to sleep There's food on my table Shoes on my feet Oh, my God. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the call of the prayer for this week for the first Sunday in Lent. Almighty God, whose Son fasted forty days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are but did not sin, give us grace to discipline ourselves in submission to your Spirit, that as we know our weakness, so we may know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and now. Please be seated for the first reading. <clears throat> the first reading, Deuteronomy 26, beginning at the first verse. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in the office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land which the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So I now bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The song is in your bulletin. <coughs> the pipes in the bowl are for the congregation. Three spots. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my stronghold. My God in whom I put my trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation, there shall no evil come to you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. 
They shall bury him in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. You shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him with my salvation. Together, gracious, gracious God, God in times of anxiety and stress, teach us to wait in quietness for your protection and defense. May it known to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Second reading is Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. The word is near you and in your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raises him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame. There is no distinction between a Jew and a Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who come on him. Everyone who calls his name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Find the words for our gradual hymn in the bulletin. We stand together to sing and remain standing for the gospel to follow.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to them, to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him, in an instant, all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him, until an opportune time. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I don't see any small or medium sized so. I think I'm far enough away, I'll do this for now. Well, story goes that there was a man who was very angry because a little church had rented out the empty store beneath his apartment and they began to hold the noisiest revival services you've ever heard. They're all many and praise the Lord all night long. He complained to the landlord. He complained to the police. He phoned City Hall. Nothing could be done. Well, he got more and more angry. Then one night, he decided he was, he'd had enough. He was going to solve this one way or another. So he went down to a store and rented costumes, and he rented a devil's costume. He went home and put it on. He climbed down the stairs and waited for just the right moment. And as it happened, a big storm blew up, and the thunder rolled, and lightning struck, and the lights went out. And at that very moment, he burst into the little church, yelling and screaming. Well, you can imagine what happened. People bailed out of the church, except one lady. And as the man walked up to her with his pitchfork and his red horns and everything, he said, how come you're not running away like all the rest? And she said, well, Mr. Satan, I want you to know I've been on your side all along. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the readings today, the Gospel reading in particular, and, and also the reading from Deuteronomy and from Romans, are about choosing sides. About remembering whose we are and what has been done for us, and declaring our loyalty. And I want to really focus a little bit on the Gospel reading today and the temptation story. Most of us are fairly familiar with it in the various versions. And I have to say, at first glance, the temptations that Jesus faced are quite different than any I've faced. You know, make bread out of stones. Well, I honestly, I've never thought about doing that. <laughs> Leap from the temple. Uh, no, going down his key hills is enough for me. Worship Satan in order to gain the world. Well, no, no one's ever offered me that. I remember thinking when I worked for the Alberta government, you know, I don't think I have enough authority that anyone's going to bother to bribe me. It's, I can't, not that, of course, I, I would have, of 
course, never accepted it, but never even offered. <laughs> I've never had those kind of opportunities, so sometimes when I look at those temptations, it, it takes a little bit of work to, to translate them into something that I experience. But of course, we do have similar things, not identical, not so much it's not so much that, that we're always tempted to do a particular thing, although sometimes that is what the temptation is. But I think that what a lot of us face more than that is, is developing attitudes and beliefs about ourselves or about the world or about the way we live in the world that take us further and further away from God's love until one day we, we reach for it and we find that there's very little left where the faith used to be. And we find ourselves without the hope that we need, without the purpose that we might. Look at what he says in the story. If you are the Son of God, right? That keeps coming up. Prove it. Prove it. Who are you really? If you really think you are, you can do you can do this. Give your the bread's easy. You can do that like that, I'm sure. If you're really loved by God, if, that's the word, right? Surely God will look after you if you jump off the temple. Think of the show you'd put on for everybody. Isn't that in Rocky Bullwinkle? He jumps off the thing and swoops around and lands in the... If you really want to change the world, if you really want the world to be as wonderful, well, I can help. If you really are a child of God, is perhaps how it translates into our lives. If God really loved us the way we claim, if these other people who are Christians and who identify as that are, are caring, well, it goes on. The voice Jesus heard as he wanders through the wilderness for the 40 days are, like we know most of us don't wander in the actual wilderness, but we, we wander about sometimes, and, and I think all of us have had those days or, or, or longer periods in our life when it really does seem like the world doesn't particularly care if we're here or not. world that seems pretty indifferent to us and to how we feel. It doesn't always feel that way, at least not to me, but I think most of us have had the odd day when we think, you know, if I were just to, no one would even notice. Like, why, why do I bother? I think, for many of us, that's the temptation. Why do I bother? If I really are a child of God, and those voices keep coming at us, just like the devil in the, in the Gospel reading keeps coming at Jesus. Not just one question, but a series of them. If you are, if this is true, if you could do that, if God meant this. If you really are a child of God, would you really act that way? If you really are a child of God, you would be able to overcome this weakness. You'd be able to straighten yourself out. You'd be able to do the good things that you, you like to say you want to do. If God really loved you, why would you suffer this much? Is there an easier way? And, and the doubt starts to creep in. And it takes two forms. One is we doubt maybe God isn't really there or God isn't really as good as they had. One of the, I remember one of the kids in my youth group way back when, she had this theory that God was a nice guy, he just didn't have all that much skill. <laughs> this wasn't very good at it. He was kind of maybe a six out of ten God. I don't think she was right, but it was hard to argue with that. She actually made a pretty good case, I will admit. But that's for another sermon. But doubting that God really means this stuff is part of how it starts to get underneath our skin and underneath our faith. And doubts about who we are and what we're capable of. And, and starting to doubt, well, maybe, maybe I really can't do this. Maybe I'm really not able to do this stuff. And the truth is, for most of us, at least some of the time, we can't do it. We want to do the right things, most of us. Most people I know want to be good. They want to do the loving and caring and generous things. But all of us 
fail, some more dramatically than others, but none of us pull it off all the time. You promise God, I'm going to pray more often, and I end up being busy. I end up watching TV, I sit down, or I've got running to meeting, and next thing I know, it's gone. Somebody online this week said, Lent is one more chance to blow your New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Well, there's something to that. But you promise God that I'm going to be more patient with these annoying people in my life. And sure enough, I'm, I'm yelling at one of them even loud, more loudly than I used to. And we start to think, well, I really, I'm not up to this. And this one's tricky because it's true. We're not. But that's part of the point. Because when we fail, we don't, we're still there. Another story. A man fell asleep one night in his cabin, and all of a sudden his room is filled with light, and Jesus is standing there and tells him he's got work for him to do, and he shows him a large rock in front of his cabin. And he explains, it's your job to push against that rock with all your might. And so he did it, day after day. He got out there, pushed against the rock. Well, for months and months and years and years, he toiled. He set his shoulder against the rock, and each night he returned back, and the rock hadn't moved an inch. Well, Satan decides to show up and see if he can maybe cause a little trouble here. And he says, you know, you've been pushing against that rock for a long time. Why are you bothering? It's never going to move. And it starts to kind of put a little doubt in there. You know, you're, clearly you're not capable of moving this rock. Why are you bothered? And that was his thought, and he took it to prayer, and he says, God, I've labored long and hard in your service. I put all my strength into doing what you ask, and yet this rock hasn't moved a millimeter. Why am I failing? But God said, I asked you to serve me. I gave you a task, and you accepted. I told her, I told I said that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength, and you've done that. I never said it was your job to move the rock. Your task was to push. And now you come to me exhausted and you think you failed. But look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscled. Your, your hands are calloused and, and hard work. Your legs have become muscled. Your call was to be obedient, it wasn't to be successful. A number of years ago, the Diocese of Edmonton had an election for bishop, and I was on the little committee. And, and we had, I think there were 17 or 18 people felt called by God to present their name to be bishop. And every single one of them, in their little material that they submitted, were very humble about it. I really don't want to, but everyone insists, and... A little bit of humble bragging on some of it, to be honest. I don't know if any of you have been involved in similar processes. I, I really don't want to, but, you know, God's call. And, and, of course, the only one person ends up being bishop. So there's a whole lot of people. And I remember saying to somebody, maybe, maybe God's talking too loud, because a whole lot of people are hearing him. <laughs> but the friend said, but maybe that wasn't the point. Maybe they weren't called to become Bishop of Edmonton, but maybe, just maybe, for some of these people, they were called to take that part seriously, to look at their life, to look at what they're doing, to examine their ministry and their role in the diocese, their role in the church, and maybe that's what they needed to do, completely aside from whether or not they ended up as bishop. In the same way that that maybe moving the rock wasn't the point. We're all going to be tempted to give up sometimes. You know, there are days where I'm very brave and I'm very courageous some days, and some days I'm ready to take you all, let me at it. That isn't every day. There are some days that, oh, well, Sunday's coming. <laughs> or whatever day. That's not the sin. The sin isn't having the temptation and, and, and seeing it and, and realizing it's there. The temptation is giving up. The problem is when we give up, not when we realize it's hard. 
Because God doesn't ask us to get it right. God asks us to try. And when we fail, not if we fail, when we <coughs> fail, because it's going to happen, trust that God's mercy and God's love and God's care are there for us. Not when we get it right all the time, but when we fail. Some of us, you know, you know people, I'm sure, who fail a lot. And, you know, they, they kind of mess up stuff pretty often. And you probably know people as well who are pretty good at stuff. But both of them need to know that God's love is there for them. Sometimes it's easier for the ones who mess up a little more often. Maybe we, they're the lucky ones in some ways because they can't convince themselves that they can do this by themselves because it doesn't work very well. I think sometimes the hardest ones to explain the gospel to are the ones that get it right most of the time. If you're one of those, you're fortunate in some ways, but I, I do hope that the times you fail aren't too tough. And that you remember when that happens that the temptation is to forget that God's love is there, whether we succeed or not. Don't give up your faith in God because you're tempted But take that temptation and hand it over to God. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Savior and be, believe in your heart, you will be saved. It doesn't say anything in there about getting it right. It just says believe. Amen. <laughs>
in the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Korea. In the Tridiocesan Intercession, we pray for the parish of Catalina, Rector the Reverend Eli Cross, St. Peter Catalina, Holy Martyrs Park Union, St. Nicholas Amherst Cove, St. Andrew Newman's Cove, St. Michael Redcliffe, St. Mark Summerford. <coughs> we pray for the parish of St. John the Baptist. Rector, the Reverend, <coughs> the Venerable Roger Whalen, Vicar Missional, the Reverend Kalia Kincaid, and the Congregation of the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist, St. John's. For one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church throughout the world, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Thank you for John, our bishop, Terry, our archdeacon, Reverend Keith, our priest, Sheila, our deacon, and those who minister in the parish. Heavenly Father, For those preparing for baptism and for their teachers and sponsors, we pray to you, Lord. 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 For peace in the world. Give wisdom and insight to the nations and leaders of the world to deal with this complex situation in Ukraine and what we see as Russia's aggression in this situation. Bless the work of the peacemakers. Bless the work of those who can lead us forward into a safer, caring world, looking after our neighbor as we look after ourselves. For the peace in the world and spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among the nations and peoples, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Heavenly Father, guide us with wisdom and insight in this changing understanding of COVID. Give wisdom and insight to Justin, our Prime Minister, Andrew, our Premier, and John, our Mayor. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, Heavenly Father, we bring before you the needs of Ava, Dale, Florence, Alec, Lynn, Crystal, Randy, Lee, Courtney, Allison, Terry, Lydia, Tony, those we name now, those we name in our hearts, and those known <coughs> only to you. And all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, we pray to you, Lord. Lord. Fill us with your strength to re resist the seductions of our foolish desires 
and the tempter's vain delights, that we may walk in obedience and righteousness, rejoicing in you with an upright heart. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And to the extent we can, without breaking too many COVID rules, we share the peace with one another. May the peace of the Lord be always with you.
the gifts is in the bulletin. We pray together. God, our refuge and our strength, receive all we want for you this day. And through the death and the resurrection of your Son, transform us to his likeness. We ask this in his name. Amen. The parts you need for the Eucharistic prayer should be in the bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth, because you bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that reborn through the waters of baptism and renewed in the Eucharistic mystery, we may be more fervent in prayer and more generous in the works of love. Therefore, we raise our voices to you in praise to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, the death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may become the sacrament of the body of Christ in his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new. And bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break the bread of life, and that life is the light of the world. God, hear us, the light in the midst of us. Bring us the light and the life. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
prayer after communion is in the bulletin. We stand together and pray. Faithful God, in this holy prayer, you increase our faith and hope and love. Lead us in the path of Christ, who is your word of life. We ask this in his name. Amen. Glory to God. Most power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for a moment for the announcement. I should say that, and I think I've mentioned this once or twice. It's always a little confusing at the end when you stand and when you sit. The theory is that you stand to say the prayer for communion because you're getting ready to go. But then we make you sit down for the announcement. <laughs> it's genuinely a little mixed up. It's not just you or me. It's, it's the services. Kind of, I think some churches, they do the announcements at the beginning, but then half the people don't hear them. We'll bubble through. In any case, announcements for today. This week, throughout Lent, on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we'll begin with a Compline service. It's, I have to admit, it's one of my favorite little services out of the old book, the Red Book. We'll do that at 7 o'clock and followed by a Bible study. We have a six-week Bible study on forgiveness. And I think it's pretty good stuff, actually. And so if you're... Uh, that, that will be here at 7 o'clock, and then we'll go downstairs for the Bible study. If we have people who are interested in the study but aren't comfortable coming or aren't able to come and would like to have the option of doing it online, let me know. Uh, tell me and I'll, I can hook that up. But I can't do it if I don't know there are people interested. So let me know if you're interested in that. And that will be Wednesday evenings throughout Lent. Our annual meeting is in two weeks after the service. Um, there's copies of the annual report at the back available, and it'll be posted to the Facebook page a little bit later today for those of you who might prefer to have it in electronic form. Um, we're continuing to gather things. The food bank's focus for March will be on canned milk and juice, both the little juice boxes and the larger sizes. What they're doing, which I'm finding very helpful, I think is they go through their shelves every month and they see that we're a little low on this. And they let the churches know and we can stock them up on that. They are happy to accept pretty much anything that people are willing to make available for them. But it, it gives a little bit of guidance for that. So that's their focus. And we continue to collect hats, bits, new hats, bits, and underwear for the gathering place in St. John, which is a ministry of the people out on the streets and throughout the winter. Final thing is that uh, many of us, all of us, I assume, or most of us, are following with some considerable heartbreak the situation in the Ukraine, and, and I don't, I'll be darned if I know what to do. I wish I could give you a little clever way to have it make sense. I can't. It's an awful, awful situation. The Primates Fund, the diocese is working through the Primates Fund at the national level to assist those um, refugees and people in the Ukraine. You'll find a link on the church's Facebook page. There's also a page at the back, because I know not everyone has access to the internet, so there's some pages there if you'd like. Pray for the situation. It is a very difficult one to know what to do. I pray for the people who have, as we did earlier, thanks for that, Bill. Pray for the people who are in situations where they have authority to act, they have to try to figure out what is helpful, how do we disentangle this, how do we find peace in the middle of that. So pray for that and pray for the, the people on all sides of that conflict who are, who are having their lives torn to shreds by things that, that they have nothing to do with. So keep that in your prayers for the next while. I don't know if it may, we'll, I think we may look at some other way to do it as a parish, but for the time being, those are some resources that are available. Have I missed anything? No? All right. Thank you for that. We'll stand then for the blessing and then for our final. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, 
and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and thanks to Bob for the music today. Setting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words are here and said? At each place, so dear, so precious, may it find me dear each day. Setting at the feet of Yeah.